Um, so now, sorry, this is what happens when you do a hybrid event. It's terrible. <laughs> um, I think we're ready. Make sure that Dash won't be also speaking. We're trying to shock ourselves. Um, okay. Are they coming in from my side or staying? Uh, one or two will come in and if yeah, they want to okay. just keep an eye in case sure. they don't work. Uh -huh. So welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum and the Writers Institute. We're delighted to do a, a co-educational uh, bipolar, all kinds <laughs> of, you know, um, amalgamations that we're doing here to celebrate Irish American Heritage Museum. And of course, we're especially delighted to have Poet, but it's a prize winning poet, Paul Muldoon, with us. So, tonight, normally in the museum, we do a kind of a very loose kind of interview, very short, few questions, but obviously, we all want to hear from the man himself. And then there'll be QA afterwards from the audience. So, those of you out there online, we'll keep an eye on you, but we're trying to placate this audience and live audience too. So, the hybrid stuff is never, um, you know, ideal in one way. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming. It's quite warm in this room, I know. So we'll get cracking. That's good. That's <laughs> just, good. But it's you know it's great to be able to see people out again. You know, it's since this pandemic, we moved in to the museum during the pandemic. Oh, did you? So it was a little bit of a nightmare. Uh -huh. So to give Paul his due, um, we're delighted to welcome him to say Pulitzer Prize winning uh, poet Paul Muldoon, who I met in the consulate's residence a couple of well years ago now, probably, but again recently, a couple of months ago, when we had a, a dinner down there, and he is literally the most significant English language poet born since the Second World War, World War, according to the Times Literary Supplement, and he has authored more than 30 collections. At the age of 19 in 1971, don't anyone do the math, he completed his first short collection, Knowing My Place. Two years later, he published New Weather, his first widely reviewed volume of poetry, and um, some of them are on sale tonight from the book place outside. In November 2022, the Irish President Michael Higgins um, named Muldoon the ninth Ireland Professor of Poetry, which is basically our poet laureate, uh, really, in Ireland. His most recent collection is Howdy Schelp, a little slap that midwives give to a newborn baby to make sure that they're uh, waking up and alive. And his, that book was named a best book of the year by the Financial Times, the Irish Times and The Guardian. So thank you to Paul and the team at the Writers Institute. We're delighted to have with us, of course, as well, our own, Albany's own, um, Bill Kennedy. So I suppose, you know, Paul, I, mm -hmm. to, in terms of the Irish American Heritage Museum, we're most interested, I suppose, in your journey as an Irish man and then as an immigrant and now as an Irish American or an American Irish and you're teaching in Princeton. So what was that like? Your first collection was called My Place. How important is where you are? to you. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I'm thrilled to be here. What a delight to be here and to be inside on an evening like this. And thank you for all of you for coming out at all. At all. I mean, for <laughs> not for <laughs> nothing to say. A major attraction. <laughs> I, I am, I, I am honoured to think that, you, uh, that you're all here. I really am. Thank you very much indeed. So, well, like many um, Irish people, um, and particularly, uh, maybe particularly people from Northern Ireland, which is where I was brought up. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> we're we loved by everyone there, as I'm sure you know, uh, kind of. And, uh, you know, we, we were the beneficiaries of, uh, well, a number of things. But in terms of entertainment, we were the beneficiaries of uh, RTE, of course. The radio television Aaron, particularly radio Aaron, um in in the 50s of course but i think before rte had even kicked before television Aaron had kicked in and needless to say of the bbc i think there were two stations of the bbc but um as you may recall the bbc uh, and then itv the independent television network in in uh, in uh, the uk and northern ireland um, UK slash Northern Ireland, um, including Northern Ireland. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we were reared on American popular culture. That was an era in which there was a at least one Western in the movie theater, <laughs> maybe two every week. I mean, they were making Westerns like like it was going out of fashion, which of course it was. <laughs> uh, 
But and then on television, many, many, many uh, American series. Um, <clears throat> this is not to speak of American literature. It's not to speak of American connections. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I have indeed a cousin, first cousin, Marina McCall, who worked for a while um, for Gordon McRae, mm -hmm. whom you might recall uh, starred in, I think, Oklahoma mm -hmm. along yes. the way. Uh, and by the way, not only were we uh, uh, in contact with the U.S. and in terms of people we knew, I mean, pretty much every family had someone who'd gone to the U.S. and maybe come back and maybe didn't. And um, Oklahoma, I remember vividly being uh, staged in Dungannon, right? So what I'm, my point is that we were brought up on American culture. Mm -hmm. Marina McCall, my cousin, who <clears throat> lived in um, California, and she brought back when, in 1962, I'm pretty sure, a book called The Golden Book of California. Mm -hmm. And actually, I knew more about California mm -hmm. in 1962 <laughs> and its history than I did about Ireland. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, do you, can are you getting my drift? Mm -hmm. So, America was always a very natural place for me to, and many of us, I think, to uh, to gravitate towards. And um, you know, so the first book I did, for example, um, I'm not necessarily going to read any of them tonight, but I mean, it has poems. Um, uh, there's a poem called The Indians on Alcatraz, mm -hmm. which uh, was, <clears throat> a, you know, a response to the takeover mm -hmm. in 1969, I think it was, of Alcatraz by the uh, Native American group. Um, there's uh, a poem here, which is essentially a response to Bloody Sunday mm -hmm. um, in Derry. In 197, January 1972, but uh, it presents itself in the guise of uh, a Native American story, also, and it's drawn substantially from the iconography uh, of "Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee," mm -hmm. which many, some of you, have, many of you of a certain age, perhaps in particular. Will remember that, but uh, that came out in 1970 <clears throat> in the U in uh, the UK anyway, as being a watershed moment. So what am I? What is all, What am I saying? I'm saying that you know America has always been part of the back of my mind as much in a strange way. I wouldn't say as much as Ireland, which of course figures substantially in the back of the mind. Mm -hmm. I mean that's. Where, where most of it is <clears throat> percolating, but it's there. Do you still call Armagh home or? You know, I do and I don't. Mm. Um, is that an Irish answer? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess. <laughs> or, or is it, maybe it's, maybe it's a US answer. Yeah. Uh, the US answer is I refuse to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> or, the, or that's a very personal question. You know, now I do, I've lived here for 35 years um, or more, and I have two children here. So, you know, I think um, <clears throat> in a strange way, <clears throat> my children, I think, mm -hmm. almost tell me where home is, if that doesn't sound too yeah. crazy, you know? Yeah, I think that's a conundrum for immigrants that, you yeah. know, you kind of are torn a little bit while you're yourself mm -hmm. and while your parents are at home, but then as soon as you have kids, it's a different landscape here. Yeah, also, also, also. I, I'm actually based in Belfast at the moment, believe mm -hmm. it or not, Belfast, Northern Ireland, um, as opposed to one of the 40 Belfasts in the US. <laughs> um, and uh, that's because of that job you mentioned, Ireland Professor of Poetry. You so you're based in Belfast. This, uh, I'm he uh, this isn't really me. <laughs> this is Avatar. <laughs> I'm based in Belfast for this semester because of this job that uh, was mentioned earlier, Ireland Professor of Poetry, where one spends 
uh, one year or half a year in Belfast oh, and then uh, Queens, oh, yeah, and then um, uh, okay. the following year at Trinity and then at UCD. Yeah. So I've actually spent a lot of time recently in Belfast and I'm about to go back there, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting at the moment mm -hmm. because it's an even more turmoil than it usually is, right. which is saying a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the elections in May, have they come out? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with. Yeah. What do you say? Right. No leadership, no government. No government. Yeah, the DUP won't. No government. You know what? <laughs> Probably good. <laughs> They're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I I must withdraw that immediately. They're not. They're not They're doing not. okay at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, facetiously, one would say that the place doesn't really need the politicians and. It would be nice to think, actually, mm -hmm. that many of the current crop of politicians we kind of move on yeah. and go and do something else, really, because they have been elected to serve <clears throat> the people of Northern Ireland, and they're not, for various reasons, mm -hmm. not quite getting round to it. I'm sure there are people in this room who are more au fait with this than I am, but you know they <clears throat> they're um... are you interested in this at all absolutely okay. <laughs> well okay. you know brexit um which of course is one of the great great disasters i'd say yeah. of recent history in european history yeah. i mean the eu whether you like it or not yeah. is actually a force that has kept many European countries more or less mm -hmm. safe and peaceful. and yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There's a long tradition there mm -hmm. of just the opposite. Absolutely. I mean, if you think of the English and the French, mm -hmm. um, if you think of it's not so long since Franco was running mm -hmm. Spain. Spain, mm -hmm. it's not so long since Greece was run mm -hmm. by the, Turk, the colonels. <clears throat> it's not so long since um, um Salazar in Portugal. 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 I mean, we're not even talking about Germany here. Yeah. We're not even touching Germany. And, you know, the, the um, British nationalism, I mean, the, what these days they say in Ireland, the big problem used to be, quote, in some intellections, Irish nationalism, mm -hmm. and now the big problem in Ireland is actually British nationalism. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Paul, it seems like England doesn't really factor the North in. Like that's what's so tragic about the whole thing. North of Ireland voted to remain. Well, it did in the European Union. That, that was absolutely right. Yeah, it did. And uh, afternoon. Come in, come, come in, in, come in. It's you missed the, the best the part. <laughs> you missed the best part. There might be, uh, yeah, seats, like, loads seat. of seats. <laughs> um, yes, it did vote to, to remain. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that came across, I think, and I hate to be, I hate to, to say this, but I do think <clears throat> it was pretty evident from the behaviour of, let's just stay with Boris Johnson for a mm. minute. <laughs> Boris Johnson clearly does not care about what anyone in Ireland thinks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they they steam, they push through this deal. Um, without any regard at all for the ramifications and the resonances in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I think at some level, they, I mean, it's they think, well, you know, it's it's just the Irish. They don't really matter. Mm -hmm. And we'll kind of deal with that. We'll deal with that down the road. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate to think that that uh, view is still has still has some um, currency. Mm -hmm. But it, do, it clearly did. So nowadays, of course... <clears throat> Are you inter really interested in this? Really? Yeah. Great. No, I'm not. I'm not an expert in this. Honestly, I'm sure there are people here because it's very hard to follow. I find, um, you know, the the back. 
the back i'm not absolutely certain if i know what a backstop is uh, yeah. sounds kind of dangerous and protocols and like the language changes you know, every week you know you know mm -hmm. so part of the issue having to do with this protocol is well let's just take the democratic unionist party view of it the fact that there might be a border albeit a a, a virtual one mm -hmm. in the sea was an indicator that Northern Ireland was not quite part of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that is a terrible thought mm -hmm. to the DU, you know, for the DUP. Even though, were they, to, were they to think about it for more than 30 seconds, which they must have actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, they've got to realise that the British do not care a hoot about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're doing better now that they're being treated as part of Ireland with the trade. With well, the... that was hilarious. Also, mm -hmm. this yeah. Rishi Sunak, Prime Minister of the UK, mm -hmm. coming over and saying, actually, you guys have got a really good thing here because you're kind of in the EU. <laughs> this this is the leader of a country yeah, that's just, part of <laughs> just left the EU. Yeah. So anyway. So what's happening there is this, there's all this rhetoric about the protocol, the DUP won't go back into government. They have been out of government for a couple of years, mm -hmm. the whole pile of them. And they basically shouldn't be paid. Yeah. You know, they're still being paid. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. And um, so they're saying that they won't go back until these, the protocol is all sorted out. What they mean by that is they won't go back if they have to play a second fiddle to Sinn Féin, mm -hmm. right? Because they would be, the, 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 the Jeffrey Donaldson, Sir Jeffrey Donaldson would be Deputy First Minister, mm -hmm. right? Which, by the way, is a, is a, an, a piece of nomenclature, yeah. which is, you know, which they should never have let through. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to talk to a few people recently who might be able to say something to somebody about this. They should never have had this idea of first minister and deputy first minister when all along the idea was that they have parity. Yeah. Right. OK, so that's not a way of indicating parity. I mean, anyone who uses language knows that they should have called them either joint first minister, joint first minister or, you know, were we able to bear a little bit of truth? Mm -hmm. Like, what about first minister? And second minister, mm -hmm. well, that's more than anyone can deal with, mm -hmm. you know, what's wrong with that? For a while, somebody's first minister, somebody's second minister, after a while. But anyway, what has happened now is that Sinn Féin, of course, has a huge, you know, has a, an advantage in the elections. <clears throat> so they're not pleased by the prospect of uh, being deputy first minister rather than first minister. And that's what it's about. Will they ever say that? Not oh. on your Nelly. Mm -hmm. No one is ever going to say that because mm -hmm. that's so stupid. Right? Mm -hmm. And that, the demographics are against them. Like yeah. This is going to continue to happen. Yeah. But that, they, they know they can say that, but that's the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, when you wrote the... I didn't expect this evening you were going quite like that. <laughs> the Irish go right to Bible college. Like CNN and everything <laughs> What do you say? We always talk about politics or sex or religion here in the museum. You know, the sex next? We might come to sex in a minute, but I wanted to follow up with um, the North. I'm trying to think of what my position is on that. <laughs> More than a missionary, I hope. Systems authority? <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, so I was going to say to you, uh, talking about politics and, and history, of course, Irish people are you know bound up and almost a little bit kind of obsessed and in Ireland, we've been celebrating the centenary of um, independence and all these different struggles. So you wrote the libretto for the 1916 celebration uh, that the state put on. Um, how did you feel about that? I know we talked about this in other talks, like there were so many poets um, involved in the 1916 Rising as opposed to military guys, that it must have been interesting writing. Is that why it went wrong? Well, I wonder sometimes, yeah, you know, these dreamers. <laughs> well, it didn't go wrong in the end. I mean, yeah. the, the reason that the reason it succeeded was because it actually, as I'm sure you know, was really had to do with the, the response to it mm -hmm. rather than the thing itself. I mean, mm -hmm. the way the way it was uh, the way it was um, 
the way it was um, the way it played out was really quite extraordinary if you think about it. I mean, they they started digging trenches in St. Stephen's Green mm -hmm. because that was the modern way of war, trench warfare. Mm -hmm. So you dig trenches in Stephen's Green. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so but to respond to your question, um because you've written a lot of musical pieces, I know, you know, but mm -hmm. this one was probably a little bit different. <laughs> well, uh, you know. <clears throat> I have to say that the way the Irish government in particular has handled the last 10 years, I think has been quite uh, remarkable and quite instructive mm. in the sense that um, <laughs> it's, it has been billed as a decade of centenaries, mm -hmm. right? And that, of course, it began with the centenary, I believe, of something to do with was it the lockout or yeah, something with, with um, James Connolly? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it went on through, um, it went on then through um, the Irish um, connection to the, to the First World War, mm -hmm. which is a kind of master stroke to fold that in. Uh, I mean, if anyone has, please, if anyone wants to speak or counter any of this, please do. I thought it was a master stroke. Because the, the, the Irish role in the First World War has been pretty much uh, eclipsed, you know. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, for a long time, those of the many, 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 many people who fought for, uh, in the First World War, um, you know, there was, I think, uh, often a little bit of a, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, there was a, a little bit of um, shame associated Absolutely. with it. Yeah, that they had fought for Britain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'd fought for Britain, mm -hmm. right? Imagine that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so, to to include that, and um, to uh, and then, of course, to um, think about what happened in 1916, and then now into the Civil War. It's actually a, a rather splendid way of I don't I don't it's not lumping things together is an inappropriate sense but to give a slightly broader mm -hmm. view you know nothing happens um out of, you know that everything must be contextualized yeah I mean including the rising in 1916 one of the reasons why it happened was that was that Britain was otherwise engaged. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can't actually disentangle, mm -hmm. you know, that bit of history from uh, another. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, anyway, so I was very happy along with other writers, I'm sure I wrote poems <laughs> over the last 10 years about, uh, you know, <laughs> World War One. And I don't know, I don't think I'm Connolly, I did a number of poems in 1916 mm -hmm. and various other things. And at the moment, I'm actually writing a couple of pieces, needless to say. You know, the, the, my problem is that when people come to me and say, Paul, how would you feel about writing a poem about the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement? Mm. You know, most people are sane enough to say, no, that's I can't do that. That's, <laughs> that's mad. How would I could I possibly do that? Mm -hmm. And what I do, unfortunately, is to say I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so but but I, and I have a go because because I feel that you know most of what I write is inspired. Let's say by, you know, something I see or mm -hmm. a phrase, an image, it's kind of motivated by <clears throat> um, a, a more conventional notion, I suppose, of mm -hmm. um, inspir inspiration. inspiration. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is that the commissioning of poems mm -hmm. um, has a long, long history. Mm -hmm. And, and, and a not unworthy one. And in fact, in the Irish tradition, mm -hmm. those of you who are familiar with it, 
we'll know that the, the, the position of the bard in a, you know, a household mm -hmm. or a, you know, with a, with a chieftain or whatever, or in a big house was one of, um, you know, writing poems to order. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so however, I think poetry may arrive, writing may arrive in all sorts of different ways, you mm -hmm. know, and, and actually maybe even good writing may arrive uh, that's written to order. I mean, let me just think of an example of that. Well, I love Anthony Lane in The New Yorker, his film pieces. It's the first thing I read hmm. in The New Yorker after the poems, of course. It's <laughs> uh, not going to be Well, um, no, but I, the thing about that, I mean, he's right. These things are written to order, but by heavens, mm. they're, yeah. I mean, they're absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. They're brilliant and funny and, you know, mm -hmm. you know. So, like, it's commissioned, like, virtually everything in the New Yorker is commissioned, virtually everything. Mm -hmm. we, a lot of what we see is commissioned, but it can still be okay. Better than okay. So you're kind of aware as a writer, Paul, of an added level of pressure when it's commissioned because you have to produce something? Um, well, you know, I mean, it's all difficult, I'd say. But mm. no, I actually welcome the idea mm. that poets might have some role in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, because mm -hmm. the fact is that that's often difficult to see, mm -hmm. you know, um, except and poetry <clears throat> more often than not um, has very little role. Mm -hmm. except you know basically a, you know births marriages and deaths mm -hmm. you know in fact moments of heightened emotional you know that are more emotionally charged mm -hmm. and, you know where there's a feeling actually you know what maybe a poem would do would would, would more would be very useful actually yeah. here in fact i use the word useful advisedly because <clears throat> utility is not something that we usually associate with any form of writing and 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 art. certainly what do you say or art like yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and certainly not poetry whereas in fact i believe it it does have a use mm -hmm. and a function in the world mm -hmm. so i'm very happy to uh, to have a go good good mm -hmm. well when you were talking i just was remembering how shocked I was to learn that John F. Kennedy was the first president to have a poet at his inauguration. You know, I because the Irish do it all the time. You know, the, the state are very involved with commissioning pieces or we always have a sort of an art, whether it's a piece of music or a poet, you know. So to think it's only been happening here, you know, since the 60s with Robert Frost and he couldn't even read the piece of poetry that he wrote for the day because the sun was in his eyes. So he had to recite one of his other works that he remembered, well, you know. You know, one of the problems... very Irish. It, well, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Robert Frost story, as I'm sure some of you will know, is, is actually kind of a, sort of a somewhat interesting one because, <clears throat> um, as you say, he was the first uh, poet laureate or at least the first... A person to read at an inauguration. Mm -hmm. So he wrote this poem, um, it's a version of the gift outright. Mm -hmm. And um, such, and so sort of the land was ours before we were the lands or something like that. Mm -hmm. is how it begins and it ends up something about the land, such as it would, such as it might, such as it might become, such as it, you know, and actually Kennedy's people came to him and said, you know what, might become. Oh, <laughs> is that enough? What about would become? Mm -hmm. So there was actually a little, uh, a little help, I think, that he was getting. So what he, <laughs> but he, the, the poem that he wrote for the occasion, which I don't think he read, mm -hmm. he read the gift outright. Yeah. The poem he wrote for the occasion uh, is fascinating because um, he referred, and it, is, it was published, and it has the line in it, um, it's something about something about the beginning, you know, this ushers in, quote unquote, a golden age mm -hmm. of poetry and power mm -hmm. of which this noontides the beginning are. Mm -hmm. So the danger with, with asking poets mm -hmm. to get involved in these projects is that they can be quite uh, <laughs> uh, naughty. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> for everything and most mentions of gold and robert frost are not actually ameliorative mm. right 
Nothing gold can stay. We all must eat our peck of gold, right? So gold, in, for Robert Frost, is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And here he is about to stand up and read his poem about mm -hmm. this being, a, you know, the gold. introduced a golden age, mm -hmm. of which this noon times, the beginning are, and I'm, I'm not the first person, in fact, uh, this, this is a theory that, it's, that's not something I myself mm -hmm. came upon, but it's, it's something very interesting. Okay, so the noontide is the, is the height, mm -hmm. is already the height. And everything, everything after noon is actually downhill. Mm -hmm. So this is the danger of mm -hmm. hiring a very <laughs> um, cantankerous mm -hmm. and clever mm -hmm. guy mm -hmm. like Robert Frost mm -hmm. to write your, your poem for you. Mm, well, <laughs> so that it takes us to, you know, the difference in interpretation, I suppose, you know, the, if the audience aren't as well read or don't know his, are not as familiar with his work, they'll think it was great. <laughs> well, Frost is one of these poets who, who excels in saying one thing and meaning, meaning another. another. I mean, those of you, I mean, the, 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 the poem that is beloved of um, <clears throat> Advertising executives, uh, among others, which is um, the road less traveled. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a poem that's quoted every other, every other see it every almost every day. Mm -hmm. It's a poem that basically very few people have quite bothered to read because it contradicts itself mm -hmm. as it goes along. You know, about this choice and this would have been better. And then he says, you know, except. Except that morning, e both equally lay mm -hmm. in leaves, no step of trodden black. So he's constantly saying, well, actually, what I just said is not right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's worth looking at it again in that regard. It's not just a, it's not just the binary, excuse me, the old style binary that, that uh, we, we would tend to think of. Mm -hmm. Which brings us neatly to Joyce and probably my last question was I want you to do some reading and then we'll take questions from the audience. But you did a masterful um, adaptation, I suppose, of the Dubliners, very famous in New York, of course, because it was um, staged by the Irish rep. And we had a, a very involved, we still do have a, a group who read uh, the reading at the moment, the Dubliners, but they've just come off a year of reading Ulysses. Mm -hmm. So when you adapted the dead for yes, the, the, the stage, dead. yeah, how mm -hmm. did that come about and... Uh, you did it with your wife and, you know, stayed very true to his original language, which I guess must have been difficult in lots of ways because it was it's a drama. So it's the dialogue and, and stage directions and everything. Well, it was very difficult, I'd say. And, um, you know. So, I mean, the real difficulty was, well, Joyce's language is there substantially throughout. So the, mm -hmm. the real difficulty arose when, you know, when one starts to put in one's own language <laughs> and, 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 you know, without ventriloquizing or, or um, what's the word, um, um, you know, yeah, ventriloquizing Joyce, you can't, you don't want to be doing that, mm. sort of par parodying. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's impossible anyways to do that. So the bits that we wrote, I wrote, the extra bits are by way of, in many ways, in, in many cases, almost all by way of explication of certain aspects of the story mm -hmm. that, um, that one might do well to uh, be aware of. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but it was a lot of fun. And it was fun working with my wife. Mm -hmm. Was um, that your first time collaborating? Or... See, I knew it would come around to six. <laughs> <laughs> Joyce, not just your wife. <laughs> um, it was, yeah. I mean, we, we read each other's works, mm -hmm. work, you know, to, to, to a certain amount. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, I mean, no, just a she, she's great in the sense that Unfortunately, you know, she she tells it like it is. Mm. So if I write a poem, <laughs> you know, rather than say, oh, that's that's pretty good, Paul, she'll say, you know, that's a terrible mistake. 
<laughs> you shouldn't do that. And it's actually much better coming from her than it is. Yeah, a critic somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I'm very grateful to her in that regard. Good, good. Mm. Well, would you give us um, some reading? We, I know you brought your range, and then we'll take questions you know, at the end. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. very briefly, maybe just read a couple of things. We'd love to hear it. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Well, what do we say? You know, somebody there <laughs> mentioned, and maybe I'll read a new one, if I can find it in here, please. I wasn't expecting to be reading this, but um, this was a poem that was in The New Yorker a week or two ago. No, here you can. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> well, I read it for you, absolutely. Yeah, because this is a newish book. I can't really find, I haven't found my way. Yeah. It doesn't have page, page numbers. Anyway, so this is a poem of, um, well, I won't say, what will I say about it? <clears throat> it's a poem. That's okay, it's a microphone. It's a poem that takes up the idea that we have, we put so much effort in removing stones from fields mm -hmm. for the most part, right? A and B, there's this one field to which we have brought many, many stones. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the basic idea. It's not when when it's put like that, it sounds a bit banal. Actually, maybe it is a bit banal. <laughs> um, you know, so let me read it to you and see what you think. A graveyard in New England. Although we've spent so much time clearing fields, it seems a plow does little more than scratch the surface of the land we'd hoped would yield 100 pumpkins from the pumpkin patch and represent a hundredfold increase. Although we've spent so much time clearing fields and taken out quite a long lease on this hacked rim of the Canadian shield, only recently has it been revealed it's not just in our beds, lovers must bundle. Mm. Although we've spent so much time clearing fields, it seems we simultaneously trundled granite blocks, boulders, and boundary turns into a single tract where we've now sealed their fates and are quite bent on holding firm, although we've spent so much time clearing fields. Mm -hmm. So this, thank you. Thank you. So, this poem, what would, well, what do you think? Very good. <laughs> what? Very good. I, I am interested always in your structure and, you know, the, the sonnet form and the repetition. Yes, now this is a form, uh, this is one of these inherited forms that they're known as traditional forms. Um, it, it's a form uh, known as the quatern. Mm -hmm. Not much used, um, really. I, I'm not sure why, because what, what happens there is you'll have deduced, well, of course, repetition mm -hmm. as in music is one of the, for many, for many, not all, is one of the um, what kind of driving forces of verse, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what happens here is that the first line uh, of the first stanza becomes the second line of the second stanza mm -hmm. and the third line of the third stanza, and would you believe it, the fourth, the fourth <laughs> line of the final stanza. Mm -hmm. But each time, as with many of these forms that use um, you know, refrains or <clears throat> um, using use the same word as in the sestina or the same couple of lines as in the villanelle. Each time you meet them, actually, there it's it's a quite different experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a quite different thing, mm -hmm. and uh, it's astonishing, really. It's the same words. But it means something slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite remarkable, really, when you think about it. Um, 
So uh, what else would we say about that? And it's using rhyme, of course, fields, yield, uh, field, uh, shield, uh, revealed, sealed. Um, it's very old style. It's the mm -hmm. kind of thing that many people nowadays would say kind of went out mm -hmm. like at least 100 years ago or maybe 200 years ago and really shouldn't be done anymore, mm -hmm. you know? And in fact, we were talking about Robert Frost there earlier on. Uh, you know, there, there's, I mean, I am doing a little bit of a nod in the direction of Frosty there. 100 pumpkins from the, the pumpkin patch uh, and represent a hundredfold increase. Mm. It's somewhat reminiscent, I mean, a very minor way of uh, of the kind of thing he gets up to. Mm -hmm. And even the subject matter, a, a graveyard in New England, Frost, you know, um, a hilarious character in so many ways. Um, first of all, the fact that his full name, as some of you will recall, is Robert E. Lee Frost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a guy with a name like that, or not, never mind, like that, with that name, <laughs> could become the quintessential Yankee poet. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Um, anyway. Do you prefer, Paul, the discipline of a structure of, of a proper formed poem? I, I don't think this is more properly formed okay. than no. It's it, no. I I don't have any brief for this kind of thing. Okay, it's do, just do the you way. Want the taste to it more. That yeah. is exactly right. Okay, yeah. That's exactly right. It just I am um, disposed mm -hmm. towards that because of my you know you know just because of the way I was brought up. Mm. Did you read poems? Sorry, I said I'd stop asking. No, it's fine. Did you read oh, poems at home? Like, I know the schooling is pretty intense, but... The schooling? Yeah, it was at school, yeah. You really read poems. I mean, people would come into the house and maybe recite a poem. Mm -hmm. You know, they would recite, I know, several, a couple of you from Ireland, you know, they would, uh, and I'm sure in this country too, a while ago, you know, they would come in and they'd recite mm -hmm. a Robert, Robert Service poem. Mm -hmm. You know, Dan McGrew or something. I was going to say, Dan McGrew, big oh, yeah. one, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's brilliant stuff. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, some interminable ballad mm. they would sing. There was a bit of that. Mm -hmm. But it was really at school that I learned. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, they made us learn poetry off in those days. There was a bit of that. Yeah. There was a bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, but then I just became interested in it, you know, when I was a teenager, as I think many teenagers, teenagers are mm. well actually first of all i think eight-year-olds are natural poets mm. many eight-year-olds if you've hung out with eight-year-olds <laughs> are brilliant poets uh, for a very very simple reason i've talked about it many times which is that they actually don't know what they're doing <laughs> um they are what do you say not exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And it's that condition that one is trying to get into mm -hmm. um, oneself, you know, mm -hmm. is the condition of even in a form like this, mm -hmm. which you would say, well, you know, I say, I, even in a form, like, I, I don't know what I'm doing in a form mm -hmm. like this. And you say, how is that possible? Because even though you've kind of committed to it, you don't really know how it's going to, how, if it's going to work out and how it's going to work out, right? Because it is driving the thing. And in a strange way, you're properly out of control mm -hmm. within it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it is telling you what to do. You know, one can make, you know, one can have fun along the way there um, with it, you know, in terms of, I was just looking at there. There's a line that I'm taking out quite a long lease, which in fact is the shortest line in the poem, for example. So, yeah, and this is the kind of thing that Frosty, as we call him, <laughs> might have got up to. And it was a poet who was very important to me and still is. Um, yeah, thank you so much. No problem. Uh -huh. I anticipate your needs. <laughs> well, I'm very, very grateful to you because I might never have found this. And that wouldn't have been the end of the world either. Let's see. Um, what else? Um, might, you know what? We're written all in that form. Well, but now we've got it. Then you're going to think that's the end of when he does. But you know what? <laughs> that's okay. That's all. 
So this is called hard tack. Um, hard tack, as you know, a ship's biscuit. Mm -hmm. um, hard tack. But a ship's biscuit might yet see us through our circumnavigation of the globe is testimony to its shelf life. True. Though you're, were you talking about the sex bit? Well, yeah. <laughs> Though your, your nonchalant doffing a bathrobe makes me think you're also playing for keeps. <laughs> that a ship's biscuit might yet see us through, maybe traced back partly to Samuel Pepys mm. and his time in the Navy, partly to our weevil sense. Mm. It's easier to chew when first softened behind the lower lip. <laughs> but a ship's biscuit might yet see us through from the time we weighed anchor at Pike Slip to our pretty much having learned the ropes, vindicates our taking the longer view and persisting pretty much in the hope that a ship's biscuit might yet see us through. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. So thank you very much. I really think you because I mean those of you who are interested in, in writing poems and maybe you already write some or you might want to write one, this is a great way to you know just check out that form the quarter. Mm -hmm. It almost writes itself. <laughs> it's another reason why I'm interested in it because <laughs> I'm not interested in work. <laughs> I'm interested in not working. Okay, we'll do another one just for fun. <laughs> right? We're good. Just for fun. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this poem having to do with those characters, I'm sure many of us have come across them or heard of them. I don't think they're quite as common nowadays. I may be wrong on this. Um, you know, the, the person who went out to buy a, a packet of cigarettes? And never came home. <laughs> and never came home. That's right. right. They I just think, ghost you now. <laughs> I think that may be more difficult to manage these days <laughs> with credit cards and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I suppose one could take on a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. I don't know. In any case, so um, by the time you read this, I'll be gone for a newspaper and quart of milk, never to return. <laughs> a half mowed long, leading to me as a scroll of silk once led to the mulberry silkworm. By the time you read this, I'll be gone AWOL, in spite of the fact, in terms of domesticity, I've outshone even the heedful trumpeter swan that spends five weeks constructing a nest. By the time you... Are you okay there? <laughs> By the time you read this, by the time you read this, I'll be gone, less because of some profound unrest than my fascination with the clay and the sand hills of Saskatchewan, <laughs> into which windswept immensity. By the time you read this, I'll be long gone. <laughs> Anyway, uh, any other questions, thoughts, queries, concerns, <laughs> complaints? We don't take complaints. You don't take complaints? <laughs> no. Because I was going to direct them towards you. Oh, yeah. yeah. We have a suggestion box outside, I'll show you. Yes. What was it like working with Sir Paul McCartney? Dreadful. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> no, it was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, so do you, do you want to say a bit more about that? <laughs> and, and what's the line between a lot of rock stars and poets? I think of Dylan winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. I think of Van Morrison. I think of McCartney. They're poets, right? Or, or are they songwriters? And is there a difference? 
A lot of questions there. <laughs> they, they are, they're songwriters. And um, there are points at which the poem and the song are uh, somewhat indistinguishable. I mean, it's a long, it'd be a long answer. Uh, I mean, first of all, you take somebody like Leonard Cohen, who's collected poems coincide absolutely with his collected song lyrics, right? Um, and the term I use for that is the pressure per square inch of your average Cohen lyric mm -hmm. is quite high. Mm -hmm. it, they're dense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, you know, they're dense. to be a bit like that, you know? And, and they don't have to be as dense as that. Mm -hmm. to work mm -hmm. you know because she loves you yeah 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 seems to work <laughs> <laughs> right and it's not attempting to do that mm -hmm. right and you know Leonard Cohen um, while he musically is very interesting um, it, the, the music is perhaps doesn't it's not absolutely as necessary mm -hmm. uh, for that to work as it would be uh, as she loves you yeah 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 need, needs that music you know? mm -hmm. the poem brings it its own music it instructs you how to read it the poem tells me how to read it it can, really can only be read in a certain way i mean they'll quickly read them in different ways but they're not really responding to what's on the page they're imagining some other thing mm -hmm. and it's got nothing to do with anything at all um so it brings its its little its conductor and it's maybe it's in fact it's orchestra with it uh whereas the song lyric needs this other component to be what it most might be in the world um so let's go back to sir paul i mean eleanor rigby for example would be a case of a lyric where the pressure per square inch is very high and where it does could would stand very much on the page right mm -hmm. um it's not the same as this, the experience of the song eleanor rigby but it is it is an experience mm -hmm. so what am i trying to say here what we what paul mccartney and i were trying to do was to um, present not the songs but the lyrics right so we were focusing on the words this was a book that we have some of you may not know about it uh, that we come out I guess a couple of years ago now the lyrics 154 lyrics with the text of the lyric <clears throat> and then a commentary um, which uh, we you know which I talked to over a period of five years about these uh, songs and that was transcribed and then edited down into a, um, a you know continuous coherent um, commentary mm -hmm. and um, what, so did what you like I, that, did, I missed a question in I there. mean did you like that assignment did you have to pull it out of him or did it just flow every time you got together with him or, or? um well Paul McCartney as you as you know has been interviewed many times in the course of his life mm -hmm. and like most of us um you know when if I ask you you know if you if someone asks me how I met my wife um I have a story, <laughs> which, and most, you know, of what, what happened to you, what's your first memory, or, you know, where did you, what was your first day at school, like, you know, these kind of key memories, you know, you've got an answer to that, mm -hmm. and, you, and usually it doesn't change, mm -hmm. and why would it change, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the answer, and, and if you figured it out once, um, you, I mean, I certainly find when I, if I get when I've got even for an introduction to a poem, I mean these new poems, I haven't really introduced them, but I might introduce them once, and I realize well actually I I should really say that about it. It would be useful if you knew that as it flies by your ear. 
Mm -hmm. And maybe I, and then it's quite likely that I would use it again, but not because I want to repeat myself. In fact, most of us don't, but we're doomed to repeat ourselves in certain ways. Um, anyway, so he's very conscious and, <clears throat> of um, the fact that, you know, he's talked a lot about over the years about these songs. So <clears throat> when we met, we um, had a, a pact, as it were, that we would not leave the room without coming, without his coming up with something, not making something up, but saying something that he hadn't quite said before. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's just a professional thing, you know, it was quite workmanlike, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Speaks to that context you were talking about earlier on too, though, that there might be an answer that you've said so many times it becomes canon, but actually there might have been a little bit that you left out well, that you haven't thought about, you know, in that long. Yes, and also, I mean, um, you know, I was, I was trying to be a little bit provocative yeah. myself in terms of aspects of this, the lyrics that might have been, you know, what I'm interested in, among other things, and, and many people are, critics are in what's going on under the surface you know we don't want to push it too much because uh, it's dangerous to push the idea i think that um, because it scares people mm -hmm. that poetry is about what's going on under the surface you know it's it's not about it's not it doesn't say what it means mm -hmm. it never means what it says it always means something else that's a dangerous area to get involved in. We don't want to get involved in that. Mm -hmm. However, um, the truth is that because they come from the unconscious um, at their best, that area we were talking about earlier on, you know, where you don't know what you're doing, the eight-year-old mm -hmm. world picture. Uh, the fact is that <clears throat> one doesn't really understand one doesn't quite get one's own unconscious. Mm. Uh, so, um, so there might be things there that, you know, that, that, that you didn't actually realize yourself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's why, isn't that why therapists exist? Mm -hmm. <laughs> among other reasons you know right we got all this stuff that we don't know about ourselves you know mm -hmm. um but in any case did i answer your question yes <laughs> it's part of it yeah. you talk about it for a long time sorry yeah that's good you got, you got a question i don't know it's turn the floor over to you if you got a question yeah. is any of this available to be read yeah, the new book of poetry. Which oh, good. I didn't have a question. Uh, Who doesn't have a question? Did you have something? I was just wondering if the the work that you're talking about is that available to which work is that? Paul McCartney? Yeah, the work yeah. that you did with him. Oh, it is. Yes, it's available a two volume set, which we did not really know. At least I didn't know. We were. What do you say? I just a lot. It's great. Well, it when we were doing it. I, I, I pretty, you know, we thought it was, uh, I at least thought, and I think he thought too, that, um, you know, it was going to be, you know, the text there, yeah. and then this commentary on the right, and maybe it was going to be a pretty basic book. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it continued, and we has got a great team working with them, um, you know, and they began to find photographs and bits and pieces of, uh, Ephemera, as they call it, you know, for the, you know, bits, you know, with something written on the back of a napkin, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, there was a huge amount of that. And the book actually became more and more, um, what did one say? More and more elements came into play, and it became, uh, it became, uh, a bit more complex in a good way, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Since, since, since we're on music and, and poetry. Yeah. Have you any thoughts about hip hop and rap? I do. Great <laughs> stuff. Great stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, 
in a word or two. Um, I mean, I'm not an, an expert <clears throat> at all, but I um, my my initial response would be, and you know, um, it's a it's a very broad church itself. It covers a lot of ground. <laughs> the basic impulse of much of it. Um, <clears throat> or it's the basic mode of much of it, as, as far as I know, as far as I understand, <clears throat> is the couplet, right? It's based on the, the rhyming couplet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, which has been, you know, the dominant mode of poetry in English since Geoffrey Chaucer. Mm -hmm. Chaucer's, Chaucer's a, a couplet man. <laughs> and, uh, and and so many, I mean, right the way through, um, you know, in the, particularly in the, I suppose, in the 18th century, you know, all those guys uh, into the early 19th, you know, Pope and Dryden and Swift and all those guys mm -hmm. um, were all into the 20th century with variations on it, like Wilfred Owen, for example. Great war poet. Um, just a slightly skewed version of it, these half rhymes that he uses, like um, uh, duck and deck. I'm just making that up. I'm not, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. And because uh, it's quite hard to pull off, really. I mean, and one of the In our culture, largely, I think, because of someone called Dr. Seuss, um, who has made, has made it somehow very hard to write a couplet without it being intrinsically amusing. Um, <laughs> so if you want to laugh, just no matter what it is. Um, and, that's, it's, and it's great for that, but it's not the only thing it does. Yeah. But anyway, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, for, they're, they're partaking of the same activity. Um, partaking of, it's not exactly the same thing, but same activity, similar activity. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, you know, they maybe have a barred role. Oh, sure, totally. Absolutely, like, yeah. of course. Totally, absolutely. And that's oh, like the ultimate, isn't it? Like whether art is to serve the people or... The intellectuals, you know, sort of. Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if it would be good if one if it were able to do both. both you know, yeah. well, sometimes it does a little of this, and sometimes mm -hmm. it does a bit of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it does various things. Mm -hmm. Another question. I mean, to be driven by the people is 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 difficult. Mm -hmm. And I, and I give you an example of why that's the case. But I'm, sh you know, in other words, you want to write something that's going to please the people, right? Whatever that means. Let's just think about what that might mean. Every two-bit Hollywood producer sets out to make a film, and most of them might say, that's going to please the people. Mm. And how often does it happen? Mm. You know. I the ideal, I think, is to make something that is so <laughs> um unget roundable, undeniable that. People come to it, you know. Mm -hmm. If you try going to, I don't know, I don't know if you have any views on this. I don't mean to sound elitist or anything. Um, it's not that at all. It's just you can't. It's very hard to figure out what the people might need. Yeah, yeah. And so the only person you can figure out, you know, you, if you could try to figure out what you need, and then then you hope mm -hmm. that somebody else might need that too. Mm -hmm. I I can't really see another way of sanely doing it you know mm -hmm. anyway there was somebody in there aging yeah that's a very <laughs> 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 we say personal <laughs> aging she has been aging um, yeah i mean uh, I, I, you know, I, I just, uh, yeah, no, aging is, 
Yeah, I mean, aging is, is one of the subject, would be this I subject matter also. It, it, it is actually more, yes, it is more and more. I mean, I've just uh, uh, written a poem, for example, about an MRI, mm. <laughs> uh, which will be in the new, I don't, I don't know, an MRI. <laughs> so we go. Yes. The loud clangy tune, yeah. Isn't the clangy tune? An MRI, and because uh, you're all getting, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's part of the part of the, uh, you know, and then of course to go back to your earlier point, there's always the possibility of, you know, doing a Yeats as it were, mm -hmm. you know, where he talks about lust, you know, lust and rage mm -hmm. attending one's old age. <laughs> <clears throat> That's always a possibility, <laughs> but um, no, I won't. Yeah, so the MRI poem will be in the New Yorker one of these times. Okay. If you still, if you subscribe to that fine magazine, mm -hmm. yes. Well, I came to your wonderful poetry festival at Sharon Springs with yes. Ellen Bass. Are you going to do more? Yes, and we've we'll... done one every year now for probably. Um, in the fall, then. In the fall, yes. It's sometime in October. Yeah. I don't have the date right here, but yeah. Who's coming? Do you know? Um, the lineup has not been absolutely. Oh, Ilya Kaminsky is coming to it on this particular day. Mm -hmm. Not absolutely finalized. Yeah. As yet. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful occasion. Good. I'm so glad. I would love to think of a way of getting more people from Albany mm -hmm. to come out there. It's only an hour away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a bit like... We'll definitely share it. Yeah, that, that would be fabulous. See? It's all about collaboration. That would be <laughs> fabulous, I yeah. Because it's great. And uh, you know, Sharon Springs is a, is a great uh, great village and trying to do some interesting things there. Does anyone else? Yeah, Meg. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just return to the dead, your adaptation... Yes, of course. Dead. It's really more a comment than a question. Yes. Hal and I are both part of the, the Joyce reading group that we've had at the, at the museum for about a year and a half. Fabulous. And we're reading the Dubliners now. Yes. And, you know, I've read the Dubliners before. Yes. Toy the Dead. What struck us, we read it around the table. We read the, the adaptation out loud. In our yes. Group. What struck me is the humor. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of the dead as having humor in it, but because of your adaptation, I think I'm I'm looking again at the short story in a different way mm -hmm. that we left out loud in parts of of mm -hmm. your adaptation. And I wondered if that was a conscious, if you were conscious of doing that, or whether you just found the short story humorous and that found its way into the adaptation. Well, I think humor is certainly a part of that story. And, you know, I, to be honest, I haven't read our adaptation for a while. I need to go back and look at it. <laughs> but we, we uh, yeah, there's humor there. Yeah. What do you say? So we were, we were read it recently, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I suppose it's more immediate because it's in the dialogue form yes. instead of reading through a well, paragraph. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, what it's kind of you you go straight to the horse's mouth. Yeah. So the characters are more obvious to you, too. Then. Yes, that's right. And uh, yes, I mean, he's he's terrifically funny, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and also <laughs> it's a it's got everything. It does. It's yeah, got yeah. everything. That story. <laughs> the dead. He's talking film. about the dead. The, the, the Dublin an adaptation of the dead. We yes. did. Uh, I think years. there's also been some film adaptation. Yeah. Yes, film. Angelica Houston. 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 Yeah. Houston. Okay. I'm Very sorry. good. Yeah. Very good. Insofar as this can be done at all. I mean, let's face it. You know. I remember actually a conversation, I think, with was it John Houston's son, whose name I'm there was a I think there was a film about the making of the film. Oh. And uh, John Houston's son. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his name now. I'm talking about I know his daughter was in it, Angelica. Yes, yeah, Angelica was in it. Daughter Angelica? Yes. And the son of, I think it was. He said, you know, there's a phrase in, in the story. Um, which is um, generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes. <laughs> and so the question is, how do you represent generous tears? Or what does that even mean? I mean, it means a lot of tears. It means, well,
So interpretations of mm. it and their think their their critical readings of it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and they take a very particular line, and it's nowhere is that more evident than with the film medium mm -hmm. medium. Yeah, because you know where what you're looking at has been chosen for you, mm -hmm. right? When you're reading it, you choose yourself, as it were, what it is you're looking at, mm -hmm. what it is you're seeing. And, um, you know, it goes back to that old saw about the difference between radio and television. Mm. In radio, the pictures are better. <laughs> you, right? Because you, make, you, can, you, you, you see what you want to see. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, especially with Joyce, because he is so deliberate with language that yeah. if you're not reading it or listening to the words, you're, you are missing something because he didn't do it in a visual medium you know uh, yes well yes except that i mean he is a very visual writer yeah and, and he was i mean as you know he ran I, did he run the first cinema in dublin I mm -hmm, think that's right yeah the volta mm -hmm. i mean i think he was very interested in cinema mm. um i mean uses a lot of techniques which are for better for one of a better term cinematic mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, it's a visual experience also. Mm. Uh, anyone else? Anyway. Well, Paul, I think this was absolutely fascinating. What a great way to celebrate St. Patrick's mm. Week yes, and yeah. Irish American Heritage Month. Um, you're the perfect crossover because you're an Irish poet now living in America. And yes, thank you. You have, um, I think, straddled the, the divide. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming out and supporting the, yeah. the museum today. And uh, you know, and and you know, I must say, had I been in your shoes or slippers, <laughs> I, I might have to stay at home. <laughs> so thank you for the you books for sale. Are you gonna yes. oh, I mean, we have to yeah. books books for sale out front? Yeah. I should just mention quickly we have our film club on Monday. We're showing an Irish language film called Rosie and Frank that's here at six o'clock. Oh. And then on the 25th of John McDonough up from the city, Beautiful. who has written a one-man theater piece about his time as a taxi driver in the streets of New York. So that's going to be exciting. It's called Off the Meter. And then on the 26th, <laughs> we're showing a new film by an Irish maker in the Brendan Fahey Baquette series about the cervical smear, uh, oh. you know, disaster at home oh, where God, yeah, 230 right. women were misdiagnosed with cervical yeah. cancer. So uh, so thank you for supporting. As you said, the museum, we're delighted to have you. And uh, thank you to the Writers Institute for joining us and for co-sponsoring. And we wish you all a happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Nile.